If you want to have your Bibles open there to Ezekiel, we're going to start reading in just a moment in verse 45 or in chapter 45. As we draw to the close of the study of this book, uh, I have said throughout this study that Ezekiel is is one of my favorite books of the Old Testament. Uh, the, the imagery that we see there, the message that is being repeated throughout uh, is one that, that really, really resonates with me. Um, but there's a phrase that is used throughout the book. And it's one that I think uh, is, is the reason why we should have a desire to study this book. And that is the phrase, it's used over 60 times, and they shall know the Lord. Do we know the Lord? That's the question that's been going throughout the course of this, uh, as, as you read through this. Do you really know the Lord? Israel, uh, just in a, a small look at the book of Judges, had we have discovered that they had lost an idea of who the Lord is, what the Lord is doing. Throughout the reigns of the various kings and the falls of kingdom, uh, it, it becomes abundantly clear that the, the Israelites have forgotten who their Lord is. And as we get to the book of Ezekiel and we read through the, uh, the totality of this book, it becomes abundantly clear that not only had they forgotten who the Lord is, they've forgotten what He had done and what He was promising still to do. And so the close of this book really starts to bring together all of this knowledge. You know who the Lord is. You need to remember what He is doing. And that's been uh, starting to be described more and more at the close with, the, with chapter 37 and 38 and this great victory that is won. Um, and the concept is that it is God that's doing the fighting. God is the one that is providing the victory. There is this idea in 36 of, of renewed life, of a transformation, God's Spirit being put into His people and His people being changed from, from skeletons to, to thriving and, and active bodies. God is doing so much. But it's at the close of the book, the last four chapters, that we see a picture that, unfortunately for so many, is missed. And that is this God that is doing all of this work, God of the Old Testament, God that is so oftentimes just put into a box by society to say that God is full of wrath and, and jealousy and anger, is truly a God of grace. That is abundantly clear throughout the Word of God, but it is made especially clear in these chapters, and it's why they have become some of my favorite chapters of the book. If you want to start in chapter 45, uh, and, and again, as with other studies of this book, we don't have time to read all the passages we're going to look at, but there's a few that I want us to point out and notice as we go through here. God has been giving this instruction about what the temple, this new spiritual temple that is being created in a new spiritual land is what his vision is all about. Telling Ezekiel that, that this, is, this is what is to be expected. This is what is to come. And we're going to see the, uh, as you go through history, we're going to see the Israelites leave captivity and they're going to go try to, to, to recreate the, the temple, rebuild the temple, reestablish the walls around Jerusalem. But what he's talking about here is not a physical structure and a physical place. He's talking about a relationship. And I hope that we see it as we go through that what this relationship is built upon. upon. So in chapter 45, there's a couple things that stand out, especially in verses 8 and verse 17. It says, this shall, be, this shall be his land for a possession in Israel. So my princes shall no longer oppress my people, but they shall give the rest of the land to the house of Israel according to their tribes. And in verse 17, it shall be the prince's part to provide the burnt offerings, the grain offerings, and the drink offerings at the feasts and on the new moons and on the Sabbaths. At all the appointed feasts of the house of Israel, he shall provide the sin offering, the grain offering, the burnt offering, and the peace offerings to make atonement for the house of Israel. So one of the first things we, that stands out in this new land is the leadership in this new land. As opposed to stealing and oppressing the people in the way that the rulers once did in the governments of God's people, he says now they're going to be providing for them. And specifically, they're going to be providing for them in ways related to their spiritual service and their spiritual life with the Lord. And if you'll recall something about the history of Israel and how they were formed, God was their first true and rightful king. When He brings them out from under the, 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 the slavery of, of, Egypt, of Egypt, and He brings them to Mount Sinai, He enters into a covenant relationship with them there that is built upon this notion that I will be your king. 
And you're not going to search after any other kings. And granted, he gives instruction about what it's going to look like when they eventually do have a physical king. But I think that was done because because this is where everything was leading. It was intended from the get-go for God to be the king of Israel. For God to be the one that is leading them and and is is ruling or reigning over them. But if you remember 1 Samuel chapter 7 and 1 Samuel chapter 8... That's not to be the case. The people look at the nations around them and they demand a king like the nations around them. And so God instructs Samuel that he's going to go and and tell them that 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 is going to happen and what that's going to look like. But he says this in verses 10 through 18. He says this, Samuel warned them what this king will do. When you read through that, what you find is this king, the kings of of this land is going to take Over and over again, he will take your sons, he will take your daughters, he will take the best of your fields, he will take of your harvest, he will take of your servants, he will take of your flocks. And God says, you're going to cry out when this happens. And I'm not going to listen. I'm not going to answer. But now we have this new land that is being formed, and it's going to be a reversal of the wickedness of, of their previous worldly kings. And I think we can see that by the language he uses. Starting in verse 7, he said, The prince shall have land on either side. Not the kings, but the prince. As if to remind us that we're going back to what has truly been established from the get-go. You're in a covenant relationship with me, and in this new land, I am the king. Yahweh will be the king of the land. But not only is there this new gracious attitude towards the leaders of the people, but also there's a new gracious attitude towards justice and making the judgments on the land. Look at verse uh, 10 with me. You shall have just balances, a just ephon, a just bath. The ephah and the bath shall be the same quantity so that the bath will contain a tenth of a homer and the ephah a tenth of a homer and their standard shall be according to the homer. The shekel shall be 20 geras, 20 shekels, 25 shekels, and 15 shekels shall be your mane. What he's talking about there is setting up true justice and there will, in a sense, be grace in their justice. Hosea 12 verse 7 gives us a picture of Israel uh, at a at a time when they are being condemned because of just this very thing, dishonesty in their balances. And it's in the way that they buy and sell. It's in the way that they say, well, that, you know, this, is, this is worth this much, and then we're going to use, we're going to use what we might call loaded, uh, loaded scales. And so it's going, to, it's going to kind of set things off. But I don't think the real problem, well, that's a problem for certain. That's dishonesty, and it's taking advantage of people. The real problem is the way they use that to oppress one another. They use that to throw one another into slavery and into prison. And and they took advantage of one another. Even the the judgments made on on moral issues were made. You know, we we have our our, uh, Lady, uh, we call the, the, the Statue Lady Liberty. That's the Statue of Liberty. We have that sense of blind justice where we have the lady holding the scales. And as she she can't see the scales to tip them one way or the other. That's part of the problem that's gone on in Israel, is that the scales of even morality have been, have been loaded so that we call good bad and bad good and righteousness evil and evil righteousness. And God says there is going to be a restoring of true balances and just balances. And I hope that we, in, in doing that, we see an idea of a pouring out of grace. Things have been upside down. We're going to write this, and it's going to come back to a way that shows thankfulness and love to others. And then in verse 20, 45 verse 20, we see that the priests are also going to behave in gracious manner. It says there, thus you shall do on the seventh day of the month, for everyone who goes astray or is naive, so you shall make atonement for the house. And you might have another word there for naive, like simple or, or even ignorant. They don't know that they've done something wrong. And I want us to consider a little bit about what's going on here. This is not the concept that so many in the world kind of preach, this idea of once saved, always saved. You know what? You're just going to cover their sins no matter what. But have you ever needed somebody to have this sort of grace with you? I've made a mistake. I've done something out of ignorance. I didn't know. And, and instead of just coming down on me in wrath, there is a, an idea of graciousness towards you. I'm going to tell you right now, 
I need you to listen to my sermons in, in the same sort of attitude that we're being talked about here. A sacrifice being made for the naive. This is a total change in the way that Israel once acted. But it's going back to a way that a man acted long before Israel. It's going back to the picture of Job. I want you to remember in Job chapter 1, how it describes him there. Job chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. This wealthy father who had all of this land and and flocks and and a great family. And the family would get together and they would have feasts with one another. And what does it say Job would do? He would gracefully go and make an offering for his children in in case, he would say, perhaps they have sinned. And I want you to see the love that Job has for his family. I want you also to see that it doesn't doesn't say that in, in either of these cases, God said, oh, Job had made that sacrifice so everything was covered. It was the attitude of Job. Here in Ezekiel 45, he says the priests are to do this not to make atonement for the people, but to make atonement for the house, atonement for the temple. There's an idea that there is love and graciousness in their hearts, that they're not looking for people to mess up. They're looking for people to be covered, for people to be cared for. There's a great grace that is in this new land. In chapter 46, if you continue on with me, I want you to note some things that are going on with the worship that's taking place here. Chapter 46 says this, Thus says the Lord God, The gate of the inner court facing ye shall be shut the six working days, but it shall be opened on the Sabbath day and opened on the day of the new moon. The prince shall enter by the way of the porch of the gate from outside and stand by the post of the gate. And then the priest shall provide his burnt offerings and his peace offerings, and he shall worship at the threshold of the gate, and then go out, but the gate shall not be shut until the evening. The people of the land shall also worship at the doorway of that gate before the Lord on the Sabbaths and on the new moons. The burnt offerings which the prince shall offer to the Lord on the Sabbath day shall be six lands without blemish and a ram without blemish. And the grain offering shall be an ephah with the ram, and the grain offering with the lambs as much as he is able to give, a hen of oil with an ephah. Again, I want you to see what we have here. We have the We have the prince is providing for the people. But there's also an aspect of holiness that is still found in this idea. Sometimes when we start talking about grace, we kind of have the notion that holiness is going to go out the window when we start talking about grace. We start allowing grace to permeate our language and our thinking. Then the result of that is just going to be lawlessness, recklessness, unrighteousness. And Paul addresses that in Romans chapter 6. He talks about grace and says, may grace, if grace abounds, may sin abound with it. May that never be the case. That's not what grace is about. It's just allowing sin to grow rampantly. Even in this aspect of this new land where gracious attitudes are pouring out, we see a concept that holiness still has to be maintained. The east gate that he mentions in those first two verses, in verse 44, or in chapter 44, um, verse 2, says, the Lord said to me, this gate, the east gate, shall be shut and it shall not be open and no one shall enter by it for the Lord God of Israel has entered by it. Therefore, it shall be shut. As for the prince, he shall sit in it as a prince to eat bread before the Lord. He shall enter by way of the porch of the gate and shall go out by the same way. God says here at the beginning of this, that this, day, this gate is holy. It is to be set apart. We are to treat it in a special way. It is to stay shut. And he gives further uh, information about it here in 46, that it is only to be open on the Sabbath. It is only to be open for a certain period of time. And not just anybody can go through it. Not just anybody can worship at it. It is for the leader, the prince of the people. He is the only one that is able to do this. And by the way, if you're reading through Ezekiel 45 through 48 and you're asking yourself, who is this prince? And it must be a picture of Jesus. I don't believe that to be the case. Because he talks about this prince needing to make atonement for himself. He needs to make atonement for himself before he leads the people. So I do think this is this idea of the government. Those that are leading or the one that is leading the people. It says this is something that is set apart special for them. And again, as we've said before, we must remember he's speaking to Israel to help them see what he's doing. And he'll describe some of these same concepts of how the... That this, this new kingdom has come to Gentiles in the New Testament in different terms. But he's trying to teach Israel what's happening. And so he uses this language that's familiar to them. But the prince is going to be the only one allowed to worship here. 
And when the prince comes in, chapter 44, says he's going to leave by the same gate. This is only for him. But there is something that is changing in the way that people worship. One, and this is not necessarily something that's changed, but it's a restoration of something. David, uh, in some of his psalms, references how he would go amidst the peoples in their worship. That it was something for the king to be there with the people as they worship their God. And that sort of idea is kind of alluded to in this chapter as well. Uh, Let's see, if you look at... Let me find my place again. Uh, Verse 8, let's start reading there. When the prince enters, he shall go in by the way of the porch of the gate and go out by the same way. But when the people of the land come before the Lord at the appointed feast... He who enters by way of the north gate to worship shall go out by the south gate. And he who enters by the way of the south gate shall go out by the north gate. No one will return by the way of the gate in which they entered, but shall go straight out. And when they go in, the prince shall go in among them. And when they go out, he shall go out. And so it seems like the prince is here. He is with the people as they worship God. But then you have this kind of uh, strange traffic uh, information. When you go in by the north gate, you got to go through the temple complex. You'll walk across and you'll come out the south gate. But if you came in by the south gate, you're going to go the opposite way. And obvious, this is because God is not a God of chaos and this is decent and order. And that's why we do it this way. I jest, but I was surprised how many commentators had something similar akin to that. This is just about traffic. I don't think that's the case at all. I don't, this, guys, remember, this is a vision. You don't worry about traffic jams in a vision. I think there's something that's being insinuated by this, and that is that when you come into the presence of God, you never leave the same way you came in. Not necessarily that you leave a different location, but you leave changed. They were coming in for spiritual worship and taking spiritual uh, time with the Lord, and they were leaving different. And the prince, the leader of the people, was in the midst of all that, but this is this idea of a great communion that is changing the people. The verses 19 through 24 of that chapter go on to talk about these boiling places, these kitchens. There was kitchens in the, in the innermost part of the temple that was for the priests and only the priests. It was for cooking certain parts of, uh, of the sacrifice, certain sacrifices. And then also there were some in the outer courts as well. In the co- four corners, there would be four kitchens, and then those kitchens were used to prepare some of the, the offerings in fact, the only offering that the, the people could partake of, if, my, if I understand it correctly, the only offering they can partake of was the peace offering. The rest of the offerings were appointed for the priests to, to partake parts of, but the people would need this someone, uh, some way to prepare the, the peace offering for them. But again, why is this, why is this brought up? It's, a phys- it's not a, a it's vision. It's not a physical thing. Why is all this brought up? And again, I think it's to illustrate the holiness You can't go into the center part. You can't go into the inner part of the courts, uh, inner part of the temple, and do what you like. This is set aside and sanctified, even though grace is poured out. And that grace is changing and molding the people, and they are growing together as a people. They must remember holiness. And they must do things the way that God has set them apart to be done. Now, if you want to roll on down to verse 47 with me. Verse 47, 1 through 12 is maybe my favorite passage in the entire book. I apologize for all of you that were following along. I just realized I didn't put any of that up on the board. I'll let you all write that down if you want, but just listen to what this says in verses 1 through 12. Then he brought me back to the door of the house, and behold, water was flowing from under the threshold of the house towards the east, for the house faced east. And the water was flowing down from under, from the right side of the house, from south of the altar. He brought me out by way of the north gate and led me around on the outside of the outer gate by way of the gate that faces east. And behold, water was trickling from the south side. When the, men, when the man went out towards the east with a line in his hand, he measured a thousand cubits and he led me through the water, water reaching the ankles. And again, he measured a thousand and led me through the water. Water that reached the knees. I want you to see the progression that we, have, that we see here. The water is getting deeper. Again, he measured a thousand, led me through the water. The water reached the loins. And again, he measured a thousand, and it was a river that I could not ford, for the water had risen. Enough water to swim in, a river that could not be forded. And he said to me, Son of man, have you seen this? 
Then he brought me back to the bank of the river. Now when I had returned, behold, on the bank of the river, there was very many trees on the one side and on the other. And then he said to me, these waters go out towards the eastern region and go down into the Arabah. And they go towards the sea, being made to flow into the sea. And the waters of the sea become fresh. And it will come about that every living creature which swarms in every place where the river goes will live. And there will be very many fish, for these waters go there and others become fresh. So everything will live where the river goes. And it will come about that fishermen will stand beside it. From Engedi to Enaglaim, there will be a place for the spreading of nets. Their fish will be according to their kinds, like the fish of the great sea, very many. But its swamps and its marshes will not become fresh. They will be left for salt. By the river on its bank on one side and on the other will grow all kinds of trees for food. Their leaves will not wither. Their fruit will not fail. They will bear every month because their waters flow from the sanctuary. And their fruit will be for food and their leaves for healing. Ezekiel has shown this river. But as you notice from the beginning, it can hardly be called that. It can be hardly be described as a river. It's a trickle. It's just a small leak. Something that's coming out from underneath the temple. But as it trickles out and, and the closer you are to the temple, it's, it's this very small thing. But the further it goes to the east, the further it leaves the temple, the deeper it gets. Until it gets to a point where you simply cannot pass through it. Not only this, but this river has become this, this giver of abundant life. And he describes how the banks are teeming with, with vegetation. And, and they are, are very fruitful and profitable. And there's all sorts of, of fish life that is, that is coming from this. And everywhere you look, everything the water touches is described as abundant life. That's really what we're seeing. Briny water becomes fresh water. And even that comedy makes the marshes and the swamplands. You might think, well, why can't the, the river affect them? Because the people desperately need salt. Salt, not just as a, as a way to season their food, as a way to offer their sacrifices. What we're seeing here is God's abundant provision of everything they need is being provided by them. But I think we also see a picture of this beautiful grace. Because whether you are close to God or you are far, far from God, it can reach you. His, his ability to reach you and provide you. Now, I don't think there's a sense where he's got this water that's coming and it's sucking everything towards the temple. It said it flowed out from the temple. Not like it's washing things away, but like it's taking the grace of the temple and carrying it out into the land and distributing it wherever it's needed, as much as is needed. And it is this life-bringing river that God supplies. And it's with that picture that I really, that I really like to end. And I know we have a whole other chapter. And we're not going to completely end. But to break down all the things he says in verse 48, I don't think will be profitable for our time. I do really hope that you will read it and think about it. But here's what I want to leave you with on these last chapters. As he, as he continues on, talks about boundaries and division of land, and as he talks about uh, portions and allotments, there is a lot of measurements in this. But if we can look past that for a minute, there's a few things that I hope that you will notice. One is every tribe gets an equal allotment. There is no partiality. There is no unfairness. Every tribe that is mentioned gets an equal allotment. Every tribe has a gate to the city. They have a way of entrance. And maybe the most significant thing, chapter 48, verse 35, is the name of the city is finally revealed. The Lord is there. For a people that have started this journey out on the river of Kibar, the banks of the Kibar River, so far from God, God is not here. And I don't know if we'll ever see him again. It comes a message that there is a land and there is a temple and there is a river that is bringing you, that is bringing life to you. And that place, God is there. And it reminds me, it reminds me of a song that we sometimes sing, a song that we will sing in just a moment. 
There is room in God's kingdom. I think that's part of the idea of what he's describing in these closing pictures. That there is a kingdom where God is, and he has room for you there. He has a place for you. And I know we sing that song, we sing it about the work that is going on, the work that you do. But at the core of that song's reminders, the core message of what we see here at the end is that there is a place that is set apart, filled with grace and holiness, and God is there. And He's calling us to it. Ezekiel's message to a people oppressed and enslaved because of their sins and a people with no hope of freeing themselves is this. God is establishing his kingdom. God is defeating your enemies. You are going to be transformed from top to bottom and inside out. And where he is, you can be also. And if you, if you don't recognize that language, brethren, that's exactly what Jesus came and preached. In Luke chapter 4, verses 18 through 21, Jesus said, I have come to preach the gospel to the poor. And the oppressed, he says, release to the captive, recovery of sight to the blind, freedom to the oppressed. The same way that people are described at the beginning of Ezekiel. In Matthew 16, verse 18, he says, I am establishing my kingdom. Something new is being made. The church is what he's talking about in that passage. Something new is being made. You need to take notice of it. In John chapter 2, verse 19, he says, I'm tearing down this temple... And I will raise it up in three days. In John 4, verse 14, he says, I give water that will become a well which springs up to eternal life. In John 10, 10, he says, I give life and I give it abundantly. In John 14, verse 3, he says, I go to prepare a place and I will come again and I will receive you to myself that where I am, you may be also. He is preaching the fulfillment of Ezekiel's letter, or Ezekiel's messages and his visions. The grace of our God has come. And brethren, I hope that we see that. I hope that we see that today a river flows out from God, from his dwelling place, and it brings to mankind life and abundance and prosperity. Not not that we will have everything we need in this physical life, but that we will have everything we need for a spiritual life with him in eternity for all time. And following shortly after Jesus came preaching these things, he would die on the cross for the sins that you and I have committed. And raising up three days later and opening the gates for all those who will follow him and enter in to this new kingdom. And I want you to consider his apostles continued to preach that message. On the day of Pentecost, they preached, repent and be baptized every one of you for the forgiveness of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And this promise is to you and to your children. And I just want you in your mind, go back to the river. To those who are far off. God is able to bring this promise to you. He is able to bring you into this kingdom. That river which flowed then still flows today. And thank the Lord we can, we can take from it. We can be blessed by it. If there are those here today that would desire to have their their sins washed away and to enter into a new relationship with the Lord, one that is marked by life, filled with his grace and his holiness, that is our greatest desire to assist you with. But maybe you've already done that and you have forgotten what God has done for you. I hope that dwelling on the book of Ezekiel will cause you to remember the Lord. If we can assist you in returning to him, we would desire to do that as well. Whatever we can do, please come forward and we'll talk about that together as we stand and as we sing.